Hello, and welcome to Baltic Ways, a podcast bringing you interviews and insights from the world of Baltic studies. I'm your host, Dr. Indra Ekmanis. What happens when nations and families fight on both sides of a great power war? Dr. Harry Merritt is a visiting assistant professor in the history department at Brown University. Today, he shares his research on national and familial feelings among Latvian soldiers in World War II, who were conscripted into the Latvian Legion and Latvian Rifle Corps, as their country was occupied by both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in the 1940s. With brother fighting against brother, Dr. Merritt explores the human stories underpinning this history and what it means for greater war narratives in his chapter for the recently published book, Defining Latvia. Stay tuned. Dr. Harry Merritt, thank you so much for joining me today on Baltic Ways. Perhaps we could start with you telling us a little bit about your background and the research that you're working on. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to join Baltic Ways. It's an exciting project, so very happy to be here. Yeah, my name is uh, Harry Merritt. I earned my PhD in history from Brown University, completing my dissertation in 2019-2020 on a topic in, in Latvian history, specifically looking at Latvian national formations during World War II, which of course did not serve the Latvian state but rather the two occupying powers, the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. And my own interest in Latvia goes way back to a study abroad experience in college at the University of Latvia, where I spent a semester there and then just kept coming back uh, after that. So it's been a it's been a long journey with Latvia, and I've been very happy to be able to complete some of this research. Thanks for sharing that background. Um, you have a chapter in Defining Latvia, Recent Explorations in History, Culture, and Politics, a co-edited volume from Central European University Press, uh, one that is supported by AABS as well. And your chapter is titled, My Home and My Family Are Now Our Regiment, National Belonging and Familial Feelings in Latvian Units During World War II. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that work and, and that research. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. This book, too, is an exciting kind of moment in the sense that it comes out of a conference in 2018 at Uppsala University in Sweden, celebrating the centenary of the Latvian state. So 1918 to 2018. And my own research, which is focused on World War II, is, of course, a time where the Latvian state has been occupied. And so there's this question of where, where does statehood and nationhood fit in? in this wartime experience. And so what I wanted to do in this chapter was to look at these units, which are, of course, opposed to one another in the war. And I can get into talking about how they were formed and their actual track record of, of service. But it's an interesting situation in which Latvians are pitted against one another on behalf of foreign powers, and yet these are Latvian national formations. So for me, the question was to consider the national element in these, because there's something very unique and, and special about it, even in the context of other national units in World War II serving other powers. And so we find that despite, of course, the focus of the Soviet Union is on class, on a sort of social class-based vision of society, of a revolutionary ideology based on Marxism Leninism, there is a major concession here toward nationalism in the form of Soviet nationalities policy. Among the first of these new wave of national units is a Latvian unit created in the summer of 1941, which is something quite remarkable when we think about the situation where just a, a year before Latvia had been occupied by the Soviet Union and was undergoing this radical and violent transformation. So it is a kind of a turnaround. And for Nazi Germany too, there were no plans uh, when it occupied Latvia for Latvian independence, for restoring statehood, and a really a kind of chauvinistic attitude toward the Latvian nation itself. This area was envisioned as German land for future colonization. And yet the first important non-Germanic unit in the Waffen SS is a Latvian unit, um, later considered the Latvian Legion. So there's this fascinating parallel development going on 
at the same time, for all of the differences and the fact that these are on opposing sides, I saw convergences that challenged some of the narratives that are very popularly held, both in Latvia, were held in the Soviet Union and in today's Russia, um, in the sense that many soldiers in these units not only took the Latvian designation seriously, in the sense that they're not fighting for Germany or the Soviet Union, but more specifically for Latvia, but that these became outposts of Latvian culture and the Latvian language in areas where these were not dominant. And so we see on both sides, the speaking of Latvian identification with Latvian sort of patriotic narratives that are being incorporated in singing of Latvian songs and celebrating Latvian holidays. And I found that convergence to be quite remarkable and something based off of uh, a common context from which these units are emerging. Yeah, in the chapter, you know, you describe kind of the the midsummer, the Yanyi Ligua celebrations, which is quite an interesting juxtaposition in wartime, right? And quite compelling to read those kinds of, of narratives. And yeah, I wonder if you might say a little bit more about those types of, of celebrations or those national events that you describe in, in your work. Absolutely. A Midsummer stands out. It was certainly my favorite Latvian holiday. I've had the pleasure of getting to experience it in the Latvian countryside uh, a few times. But because it's such a prominent moment on the calendar, it was very interesting to see how it was celebrated in these units. And we can consider the fact that you have basically parallel celebrations um, happen outside of Latvia in 1943 and 1944 in both the Waffen-SS Latvian Legion and the Soviet Union's Latvian Rifle Corps in the Red Army. Uh, for the Latvian Legion, it's somewhat less surprising because in the German occupation, there is this general kind of restoration of many cultural norms. So of course, they are also celebrating holidays like Christmas and Easter, important holidays in the Christian calendar for many Latvians, in addition to Midsummer, which is officially commemorated from the top down, organized by these units, um, features prominently in the memoirs and memories of many of these, these former legionnaires. Somewhat more surprisingly, um, on the Soviet side, uh, you find also official organization of Midsummer as a kind of also a top-down and bottom-up exercise. So big plans are made to organize singing and dancing in honor of the midsummer holiday. They even brew beer and prepare a cheese that is eaten on that holiday. I found in another account something very fascinating too, which was in the Red Army, of course, you have, in addition to men serving as combat soldiers, you have women in both combat and non-combat roles. And these Latvian women in the Red Army made an effort to try to create traditional dresses so they could look the part wow. for the summer. And according to these accounts, they bartered with Russian villagers for cloth, borrowed a blanket from a Uzbek soldier who was in the unit and used aluminum from downed German airplanes to create brooches. And so you see the kind of Goodness. prominence of this holiday being celebrated in parallel, again, by these opposing sides. In, in 1944, uh, some of the celebrations are canceled because the Red Army units go on the offensive. But you could just think that both of these units celebrating this holiday at the same time a fascinating convergence. Yeah, wow. What a sort of compelling kind of connection to those national sentiments. You made a case for including personal accounts of the war in your chapter. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about the debate, what personal accounts tell us historiographically about World War II and, and war, perhaps more generally. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to. If I could try to maybe speak to a, a larger context, I think we do see a turn over the previous uh, several decades toward incorporating more um, of these kinds of first-person accounts. Sometimes they're called ego documents. That's more common in the Russian historiography. But um, primary sources that are coming from ordinary people involved in the event. So not just thinking about the memoirs of generals and high-ranking officers or at the level of diplomatic history, political leaders, diplomats and others, but to try to think about how we can better understand war, not just through military records and documents to, that speak to the operational uh, and tactical history of war, but what was the experience, the sort of social historical look at this? And I am 
I think, very fortunate in coming into this topic that is as fragmented as it can be, and we can talk about the fragmented nature of the historiography, that there are a lot of sources out there. We can think of sources collected in Latvia, oral history sources. There's an oral history project at the University of Latvia. The Museum of Occupation has had a major effort since the restoration of Latvian independence in 1991 to collect and gather oral histories from all of those people who experienced various aspects of the occupations of Latvia in the 20th century. And that collection continues to expand. We also have interest testimonies that focus more on those Latvians in the Red Army. So there are oral history projects of various types that have been established uh, for the memory of uh, the what in Russia and the Soviet Union was called the Great Patriotic War. Very interestingly, there's also a source base collected at the time during the war. This is called the Commission for the History of the Great Patriotic War, otherwise known as the Mintz Commission in the name of its director, Itzhak Mintz. And it's, it's a really fascinating idea because it is a historical commission designed to collect oral testimony of the war, to write a future history of the war during the war at a time which I think in the Soviet Union, it's not really clear that they were going to win the war, I mean, mm -hmm. even if that would you know, not fit with the official line. And so you have soldiers being interviewed about events just months after they happened in, in, in the battlefield sometimes, oral wow. historians being sent out there. And there are debates by various historians. We can kind of contrast the approach of, of different historians of, of the Soviet Union, some expressing sort of the opportunity that these sources represent, others expressing skepticism, because, of course, this is still Stalin's Soviet Union. And the question is, how freely are these people speaking? But I... I found that there's quite a lot of things you wouldn't expect to hear if this was just mm -hmm. propaganda in the transcripts of the text here. So these are all sources that I looked to with great excitement as I wrote my dissertation and as I produced this chapter for Defining Latvia. And I know that there's it's it can be uh, problematic in a couple of different ways. Of course, the Mintz Commission was never used fully for the way it was intended because instead, in the period of the Zdanoshina after World War II in the Soviet Union, official histories were written that kind of excised many of the contributions of ordinary soldiers, any of the kind of counter narratives that emerged during the war in favor of a Stalinist orthodoxy. And this continues somewhat throughout, even though there are interesting examples uh, in the Latvian SSR in the 1980s and earlier of trying to use some of these sources. For other sources, I think there's a skepticism that exists in parts of the academy in Latvia with the sense that these first-person sources can be flawed in, in a variety of ways. If they're recorded many decades later, memories can fail us. Events can be confused and confabulated. Names or locations or dates can be forgotten. And so there's this issue that persists, as well as the possibility that the longer time elapses, the more people might repeat larger narratives that they have learned since the event. And, and that overrides some of their own memories. And in this way, I understand the skepticism, but I was inspired by trends in the historiography of the Holocaust, which uh, um, points out several things. One is that these primary sources are very valuable. They can tell us things that we otherwise would not learn about. Uh, dry military documents, state-based documents don't record these kinds of either personal opinions, small anecdotes and interactions, feelings, affective relations, but also that uh, in most cases, but with a healthy skepticism, we can also consider people are trying their best to speak their truth and that their experience of the war is coming through. So I, I, I advocate for their use, of course, with a bit of healthy skepticism. But I think that the results can be fascinating and it can in enrich our understanding of the history. Yeah. You know, it occurs to me that so much of the way that we think about and analyze and learn about histories of conflict are limited to the sort of geopolitical machinations or the diplomatic understandings of why or how war begins or is conducted, but it very often leaves out the very human factor. And of course, the human factor is, is the critical part, right? It, it is humans who, who ultimately suffer from war. And so 
that is a, a compelling reason to include those those narratives. But you know, in some ways, several things that you t- that you write about in this book um, make it kind of impossible not to draw some comparisons to the early days of the Russian invasion and war in Ukraine, where one we see the first person accounts very clearly plastered across social media. And there's a direct kind of relationship between the personal accounts and and the viewers, the viewers of war. So this is one kind of parallel to your work. And and the other parallel that I think of is these familial ties that you also kind of reference in, in your chapter about people being on both sides of, of the border, right? There are familial ties that 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 bind people and i i wonder do you have any any thoughts i think because of the the nature of this event it's it's horrible impact on so many people it it is really difficult to fathom but i think that it does point to the continuing importance of these historical narratives especially those centered around world war ii and for the entire region, not just in relationship to Russia and Ukraine specifically, but I think that these animate people and help them try to make sense of the world at the same time that they're also manipulated and used by states to justify uh, unjustifiable actions as, as today in Ukraine. Um, so we have coming out of Russia from its Soviet experience, a narrative of World War II, which we often use the the Soviet title for the war, the Great Patriotic War. It is a war narrative that is very compelling, I think, for those who came out of this because of the massive destruction that was wrought on the Soviet Union, as well as the sacrifices and ultimate victory of the, the Red Army and the Soviet Union, along with its allies against Germany. Um, And yet there's a lot of things that are sort of uh, papered over, erased in that. So uh, the Holocaust doesn't exist in that narrative as we sort of know it today. Jewish victims are subsumed into this category of peaceful Soviet victims. Um, The unity of the Soviet people is emphasized for, of course, in cases like uh, Latvia, the other Baltic states, Ukraine, these territories that were occupied by um, the Soviet Union immediately prior to participating in in World War II from from June 1941 onward, people are very divided. There is a lot of disunity for very obvious reasons, even though you do have people on either side of the conflict. And, you know, this uh, narrative is interesting in terms of how it affected, I think, Latvian veterans of the, the Red Army. They uh, were fighting uh, in part animated by this Soviet patriotic narrative, a narrative of anti-fascism fighting against Germany, of course, which they could say is an occupier of Latvia too at that time. But we see a bit of a collapsing of the narrative after the war because from these very high hopes that I see in these personal accounts of a sort of new start for Latvia in the Soviet Union, that things would be different than that first year of occupation. Those hopes are dashed and uh, anti-fascism becomes less and less coherent as an ideology um, and more of a kind of tool of the regime. And we see that in some of the justifications that are launched, that launched the, the war uh, against Ukraine. It is this very strange anti-fascism that is an- ahistorical and doesn't really relate to the situation on the ground. So we see this abuse of history in that way as well. Um, although, I, again, for as much as these justifications that we saw um, leading up to and then now during this military operation by the Russian uh, military, um, we have a strange mix of this sort of imperial nationalist Russian nostalgia. We have grievances uh, from the breakup of the Soviet Union. We have elements of tension from between Ukraine and Russia of the past decade. But the most compelling things for a lot of people seem to be going back to World War II. Mm -hmm. And so we see the St. George ribbon being used as a prominent symbol for Russian forces, the symbol of victory, a symbol associated with Victory Day, May 9th. It is much more compelling to people than this strange new Z symbol that appeared on Russian armored vehicles. Um, Even on the Ukrainian side, it is interesting to see 
that they can also lay claim to this heritage with President Volodymyr Zelensky declaring several Ukrainian cities, Kharkiv, uh, Chernihiv, Mariupol as hero cities. This was a Soviet designation for cities that fought heroic resistances and sieges during World War II. So he is also laying claim to this heritage as part of a, a sort of form of defense. I think too, um, there is, is a way in which narratives around the Latvian Legion, which have always been very internationally controversial, are just shaped by this experience of the war. And so you typically had a idea that, that was very much cultivated in the post-war Latvian exile community, those refugees who fled Latvia, of holding on to this belief that the Legion had been formed and fought for Latvian independence, though the Germans had no intention to fulfill that. And that's a tricky thing because you see in the personal accounts that people are very attached to this. You see all the national symbols, all of the national nationalistic sort of attachments to Latvia. And yet, of course, there is a divergence between their personal beliefs and goals and the goals of the larger power, the occupier to whom they are attached. And that that's a tricky thing to rectify. And that feeds into narratives going all the way to today in contemporary Latvia. On the other side, you have a Soviet narrative that more and more over time accuses every member of the Latvian Legion of being a Nazi, of having the values of the SS embodied in them and being uh, war criminals. And many of these charges are, are, are false during the Cold War. Uh, it did a disservice by falsely accusing some of these Legion veterans, while of course there are other war criminals who are not being pursued or not being investigated in that way. And this vision carries forward toward Russian propaganda to today, by which the Legion is then accused of being Nazis. Latvia is a Nazi collaborator nation. And this strange set of ideas that feels very similar with Ukraine goes in uh, all together to sort of justify some sort of hostile action. And that's a very difficult thing to entangle. And I, this is why I always like to get back to these smaller primary sources that let us look from the bottom up in addition to these top-down narratives that, that become established and popularized and then made official in many ways. Yeah, absolutely. The history, especially World War II history, is, is so complex that, you know, not, when it's not handled carefully, those, you know, grains of truth can be quickly spun into fields of falsehood or, you know, that just feed the propaganda and disinformation machine like you so eloquently have explained to us. And that makes the role of the historian quite difficult. It, it, it absolutely is a minefield, I think, to use a military metaphor. So many of us hold these narratives near and dear, and they can be very animating. Again, this great patriotic war narrative is so foundational, I think, for um, many Russians, others in some of the post-Soviet nations, I would say Belarus, even Ukraine to a degree, in the sense that this history is still being used by the Ukrainian government under President Zelensky, as well as, you know, the, the, the narratives um, in Latvia that are held so dear that also relate back to World War II. If we think of the number of commemorative dates, um, official and unofficial related to World War II, thinking of uh, memories of the, the Soviet deportations, memories of the, the Holocaust, and then in, in more unofficial terms, memories of the war in these units. We have March 16th, Remembrance Day of the Latvian Legionnaires. This has often been a flashpoint. It's well, it was only official from 1998 to 2000. And this is very important to some Latvians as a sort of national moment, again, affirming the national qualities of the Latvian Legion. But you would have found many of the Latvian veterans of the Latvian Rifle Corps and the Soviet Union celebrating May 9th, Victory Day in Latvia. And so this divided set of relations whereby the narrative uh, speaks to one's social milieu and someone's understanding of one's identity, one's position in the country and in the world. It, it is really important. Looking back at this, I, I think too of how I start the chapter, which is thinking of an oral history with a Latvian soldier named Petris Chachka who dodged the draft uh, into the Latvian Legion and accepted being drafted into the Latvian Rifle Corps when the Red Army moves into Latvia in the summer of 1944. 
But he insists both that, you know, everyone he included in the Latvian Rifle Court were nationally minded Latvian patriots, but actually that also both sides are fighting for Latvia. And these little stories um, can tell us about both the possibility for reconciliation and the way that this existed, even as a very brutal fight was being waged. In these accounts, memoirs, and interviews, you find moments uh, during the battle for Kurland, for Kurtema, in 1944 to 45, where Latvian soldiers are fighting each other directly because their units are positioned across from each other. And there's interesting moments where little truces are attempted or decisions not to shoot each other. During the Christmas battles, there was a story of a Latvian legion patrol encountering Red Army soldiers, and they shout at them in Russian to hold their, uh, to put their hands up. And these Red Army soldiers respond in Latvian, hey, don't shoot us and we won't shoot you. And they both walk away from this uh, encounter, <laughs> as well as other attempts to, to reach out uh, to former acquaintances across the lines, especially as the war seemed to be winding down. So these narratives can be the source of conflict. They can be the pretext for horrible actions, but there can also be a basis for reconciliation, for evolution of narratives to be more inclusive and in reflecting the wants and desires of, of ordinary Latvians. Yeah, and, and to speak really, again, to the, the humanity under, underpinning it all, right? And kind of the horrors of, of war, to, certainly the horrors of war, to, to be positioned in a, in a way to, to shoot your own countrymen or humans. My work wants to consider agency, and that's a hard thing when we're in these horrible wars waged by powerful states, right. um, where it seems like human beings are, are being put through this inescapable gauntlet. And what I would like to say is that, of course, these soldiers had hopes and dreams of their own. They reflect it in their writings, um, in their own discussions. I had the great pleasure and opportunity to speak with uh, four veterans, two from each side, when I was preparing my dissertation to, to, to interview them in, in Latvia. Um, and unfortunately, that generation is, is passing away, so we will soon lose those individuals. Everyone I spoke to was well into their 90s at that point. And so to hold on to these, these sources and think about the possibility for agency in these very difficult and deplorable situations, of course, which Latvia has gone through many in its national history, especially in yeah. the dark days of the 20th century. But to try to not forget the ordinary men and women, in addition to the powerful states and the big official narratives that they create and propagate. Well, that sums it up very well. Thank you for, for taking the time to, to speak with us and to, to share these very personal and human connections uh, and stories in a time where it is critical to remember, remember the human, human cost of war. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I hope everyone will consider reading the book, Defining Latvia, and hope for uh, better, more peaceful days ahead of us. Thank you for tuning in to Baltic Ways, a podcast from the Association for the Advancement of Baltic Studies, produced in partnership with the Baltic Initiative at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. I'm your host, Dr. Indra Ekmanis. A note that the views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AABS or FPRI. For more information on Defining Latvia and Dr. Merritt's recent work, on World War II monuments, check out our episode description notes and subscribe to our newsletters at aabs-balticstudies.org and fpri.org slash baltic-initiative for more from the world of Baltic studies. Thanks for listening and see you next time.